Before coming to China, I must admit that our image of the country was at best woefully cliched and at worst hopelessly ignorant. But with every province we travel to, our preconceptions are gradually replaced by a deeper, but still very much far from complete, understanding that China is as varied and diverse as just about any other country on earth. And in one of our most eye-opening trips to date, which was entertaining and educational in very much equal measure, we stumbled blindly into Fujian province, and more specifically, into Huking village. We came to see the amazing Tulos, great fortress-like structures built by a people who, in all honesty, we didn't know all that much about. But as we listened and observed, played, and drank, we found ourselves increasingly intrigued, perhaps even borderline obsessed by these incredible homes and the culture of the people who inhabit them. But before we go on explaining just how these amazing buildings came to be, I would like to stress that we don't aim to make videos teaching what we know, but rather to share what we learn. And our knowledge of China's many different subcultures is very much a work in progress. So if you are a hacker yourself, or are able to fill in any information that we miss, then jump down in the comments and share what you know because we really want to learn more. And P.S. Whilst we definitely aren't professional historians, we will try to at least do a better job than Disney, who in a spectacular display of ignorance decided to set their adaptation of the ancient Chinese legend of Mulan in the Tulos of Fujian, even though the first one wasn't even built until 700 years after her time. Also, this slightly more amusing anecdote, this old chap told Jack that way back in the 1980s, American analysts poring over satellite images mistook these donut-shaped tulos for missile silos, which was obviously not true. Although, admittedly, they were built with the military purpose in mind. Anyway, we'll get to that in a second. First, we need to talk about the people who dreamt up these ingenious structures. The local people are referred to using the Cantonese word hacker or the Mandarin word kuja, both of which literally translate as guest people. That's because, despite being predominantly found in the southern provinces of Fujian, Jiangxi, and Guangdong, the hakka are actually believed to have originated in the north of China, migrating southwards over many centuries due to multiple conflicts. But unfortunately, even after settling in this beautiful and one would assume peaceful part of the world, they were still unable to relax. For the past millennium, and probably earlier, southern China was both plagued by bandits and land disputes between rival peoples, which often erupted into full-scale conflicts. So, after a tough few centuries, when the hacker laid down roots in this area, they weren't taking no chances when it came to constructing their new homes. It really feels like a castle, a fortress, whatever you want to call it, because it is. Yeah, and if you notice, they've only actually got windows on the top two floors. Oh, yeah, I didn't notice that. Yeah, so basically the bottom two floors, which is normally where they're cooking and where there's like the storage, they don't have any windows, that's for security. So that if someone's attacking, they can't come in through the windows. The defenders can shoot at them with homemade muskets and rifles, at least back in the day, <laughs> from the top two floors. But just because these tulos were initially constructed with defense in mind, this being China and all, there was no way they were missing the opportunity to give the tulos a beautiful but functional entrance. I absolutely love the entrances to all of the tulos. They're so beautifully designed. And you'll notice there's usually only one main entrance. And that's for security reasons. Basically, they take a single massive block of granite and carve it into the uh, entrance you can see behind us, meaning that they can shut the gates and shut out any outsiders from coming in. When building a Tulo, besides security and beauty, perhaps the most important consideration was location. Before construction began, a feng shui master chose an ideal location to form the center of the circle. The door would usually face westwards, with an ancestral hall directly ahead of where you came in. So what's interesting about this Tulo is their ancestral worship space is actually 
here on the right when you come in. Now usually it's opposite the door and the reason for this is because their door actually has changed places. So their entrance used to be over here, but this is considered unlucky. And so they changed where the door was to over here because the feng shui really matters. People really care in China if something's lucky or unlucky. And as is the case in much of China, here in Huking village, people truly revere their ancestors, which is why every Tulo has an ancestral hall, be that a simple area at the back of the Tulo or an entire standalone temple as is the case in this magnificent Tulo at the top of the village. This Tulo is amazing. Look at this huge ancestral hall that is inside it. Still not grand enough for you? Then take a stroll across the village and you will find the Jiang family ancestral hall. And an interesting fact about this village is that everyone has the same surname, which is Jiang. Despite moving into a new house on the outskirts of the village, this lady still comes back every day to pay respect to her forefathers. She also insisted we try the spring water, which bubbles up into a well inside the center of this tulo. Well, that is not so refreshing. I just want to swim in it. A little bit of Daobao. The thing that's kind of most impressed me is how all the families share that most precious of resources, water. But it seems to me that they all have kind of a well in the center of them. And then this is more or less like continuously bubbling. So maybe it's a spring or something. Oh. And then there's all these little taps all around, as well as an elaborate pipe system to make sure that everyone has enough water. And then there's a generally a drain system that goes all the way around the edge of the Tula, which comes in pretty handy when it comes to cooking. And speaking of cooking, what's really interesting is some people have extended their area to make an outdoor kitchen. Perfect for getting your chow fan on in the uh, stifling summer heat, eh? And at breakfast, lunch or dinner, the perimeter of the courtyard is the place to be. Unless, of course, you're one of the local chickens. The Tulo comes alive with the sound of clattering pans and the scent of tasty food, the vast majority of which is homegrown in small plots of land surrounding the Tulos. So we've got this very interesting vegetable for lunch. It kind of looks like meat, but I know it's not. I know it's vegetable. Could be a mushroom. You got shrewd sides, I'm a short. This is our This is if you are a vegetarian, I could see how they would be a good meat substitute because they felt really like meaty, didn't they? And had a similar texture. I think it's safe to say that we were quick converts to the virtues of Hakka cuisine. And this was some of the freshest food I'd ever tasted. Literally going from farm to table in a matter of hours. So this is her vegetable patch. Lovely fresh looking greens are on the ground and I think we will be having them for dinner tonight. I've since learned that the Hakka people have long had a reputation for their thriftiness and ability to cultivate even the most difficult of terrains, often at high altitude. I suppose this self-sufficiency was born out of necessity due to their former migratory existence and the fact that they have often settled or been forced into some of China's less desirable farming locations. And as most people seem to rarely leave the village, it does seem that if there's anything that they can't get hold of, little trucks will come around most days selling things like bread or even clothes. As I ambled around the village learning more about their farming methods, I was struck by the fact that, like many villages across China, the demographics in this village seem slightly skewed. Most of the residents of this village are old or women or children. Yeah, and that's because I think most of the uh, husbands or the young people have all left to go to bigger cities to find work. Mm. 
，他们还住在这里吗？没有，漳州在漳州厦门。你这里有点难过，因为你的你的老公在厦门。Uh, Not that those left behind seem all that faced by the mass exodus of their working age folks. You see one to Xiamen ma? It seems that people here are pretty happy with their lot, enjoying the virtues of their wonderful natural environment. And besides, the community support structures here are very strong with each family member having an equal share of the tulo, and my sense being that people have each other's back. I do kind of quite appreciate the way they're designed, the way that everything's equal. Mm -hmm. I feel like they invented like socialist housing like 800 years before it kind of popped up in communist countries around the world. But you know, one thing that I have noticed is that some are kept in better condition than others. Yeah. And I felt like this one was perhaps on its way to becoming a little bit run down, which is kind of a shame. Generally speaking though, most of the Tulos are lovingly cared for by their residents who are all too happy to show them off to visitors. We went to a lot of other tools. I think that you are the most clean. Every person comes to say that our house is very good. That's your house. I'm that one. If you want to see it, you can see it. You'll have to excuse the shaky camera work. Running up and down these stairs every day means she's a lot fitter than us. So your house is your house. You can put it in here. Ah, OK, so it's like storage. So your house is your house. No, there are people who don't have it. I like to see it here. Given their turbulent history, the hackers would have every right to be a little suspicious of outsiders. But walking around as a foreigner, you're unlikely to make it far without being offered to come inside for a cup of that most treasured of local beverages. A little cup of tea. Yes, tea is a serious affair, with people knocking back the stuff all day, every day. You see her charma. What are you doing? You see, it might look like I'm relieving myself, but actually I was just inspecting these tea bushes because even though that Fujian is really famous for its tea, these are actually the first bushes that we've actually come across. And there's a pretty interesting reason for this. A few years ago, there was like large scale tea production across the area, but the government actually put a stop to it to, in a bid to try and kind of save the environment. So what farmers do now is they have all these kind of like little mini plantations, tea plantations, where they just grow enough tea for them and their friends to enjoy at home. And the tea isn't the only thing the government is keeping under strict control. Due to Hooking's protected status, you won't find the kind of mass tourism that is prevalent at other Tulo clusters. In fact, we were the only visitors in the village. Our trip made possible by choosing a homestay experience with Laoja, an awesome organization with long-standing Guangxi with the local villagers. The tulo that we've been staying in is over 400 years old. It was one of the first rebuilt in the village. Many of the families started out here before their families got too big and they had to move into newer tulos. And during our stay, we did much the same, branching out to explore each and every one of the 13 tulos in the village. Some big, some small, some built in the traditional round shape, and some, which like ours, are shaped like the Chinese character Hui, and also one which is rather peculiar. So we've been wandering around the village trying to find a pentagon tulo. Jack, do you think we finally found it? Um, well, from what I see, it could have five sides. Let's go take a look. Let's have a look. One, two, three, four, five? Kinda? It's like half a wall. On many of the two lows, the walls actually slope inwards. And no, this is not them caving in. This is actually a deliberate part of the design process. The walls are basically designed with an inwards facing incline so that they push together, making the whole structure stronger.
So have you found communicating with people here? To be honest, it's a bit of a struggle. Like the vast majority of the elderly people who inhabit the village speak no Mandarin. Some of the middle-aged people speak a few words or a little bit. And actually we've had the best success communicating with the kids because I guess they learn Mandarin at school. Yeah, and they've spoken a little bit of English to us as well, which has been really cute. <laughs> And after looking into it, I learned that more people grew up speaking the various hacker group of dialects than the entire population of Sweden and Australia combined. How's that for a fact, eh? And whilst we're sharing facts, we would love to hear from you if you are of hacker descent and could teach us more about what to me seems like an incredibly deep and varied culture. And for the rest of you, leave us a comment telling us where we should go next in China and I promise we will keep making videos sharing what we learn along the way. The end.